I guess we're a week away from seeing uh, Nick Foligno get in the lineup, and I believe he's made his way up to Toronto. I think he drove up, and he's living that quarantine lifestyle. And uh, here he is, one of the newest members of the Maple Leafs. There's been a few new members over the last couple of days. Here is Nick Foligno. How you doing, Nick? Very well. How you guys doing? We're doing okay. How's that quarantine lifestyle treating you? Oh, it's day one, and I've already been bored, so I'm nervous about a couple more <laughs> here. But I can't complain. It's all good. It's all for the right reasons. Yeah. Is it, is it an opportunity for Sheldon Keefe to, you know, bury you with game tape and pick your brain on what you see and what you what you want to do? I mean, what what kind of instructions have the Leafs given you uh, for the for the upcoming six days? Yeah, I think uh, they were getting through the back to back, and then he said he was going to get a hold of me with some game tape and some film of things. So. I'm sure I'll be buried in it, and uh, but I've been watching the past few games, and uh, you know I'm getting excited. Obviously, I, I'm you know I'm missing hockey right now. I feel like I'm out of a routine, so uh, I'll be probably happy for the first time in my life to watch game tape. Um, so it'll be fun. <laughs> so Nick, you're obviously uh, an Ontario guy at heart. You know, spending your off seasons in Sudbury. But what, what's gone through your mind uh, as you've kind of gotten acquainted with Toronto? It's not the same Toronto right now, obviously, from a hotel room. Uh, but as you're sort of sitting here in Toronto where your dad played, and I know you, you talked in, the, in your first media availability about your memories of your dad playing as a Leaf in that magical 1993 run, what goes through your mind? You know, I, I didn't realize my own reaction and how excited I would be. You know, I think just, you know, obviously my dad played and I was young, but I, I I think just knowing the passion of the fans and remembering that run that they went on and kind of envisioning if we can get something like that rolling, how amazing that would be. Uh, you know, my dad still talks about it. So obviously it resonated with him and, and how incredible uh, and electrifying the, the city was. Um, so to be able to kind of have a chance to be a part of that and join this team who, you know, it's just done such a great job, obviously, this season. I'm just thrilled for the opportunity. I really am. I'm, I'm excited to come in and help where I can, um, you know, and, and already a, an impressive team and, and, and learn from these guys. You know what I'm saying? Like, everyone's talking about, you know, me coming in and the leadership aspect, but there's a lot of leaders in that room, and, and I always love learning from other guys and how they go about it. And so I'm, I'm just as excited about, you know, offering up some stuff, but also learning and then sitting back and, and, you know, admiring some of the guys in that room that have done it for a lot longer, and uh, and it's only going to make me a better player in person. We're chatting with Nick Foligno. In terms of, of what you will bring to the table, I think a lot of Leaf fans are very familiar with your game and, and have seen you play many times, including last year in the bubble, obviously when Columbus took on the Leafs in that five-game series. But um, what do you picture as an ideal role for you that would offer up the most production and the most help for the team why, why do you think you know Dubas would reach out and say I got to have Nick Foligno and here's why because this is what he's going to bring well I think they want me in Matthew's spot first off <laughs> <laughs> I could help, um, could help the power play no. right now you never know <laughs> yeah. I know I, I think you know I think it's going to be just wherever's needed you know I don't really think we've had a, a real conversation about how it's going to fit because one thing I've learned in this league is nothing ever goes according to plan. <laughs> and, and you can plan it out in a million different ways in your head, but until a guy gets in there, until a guy really finds his role and, and whatever role that may be, obviously I, I'm confident about my abilities and what I can bring, but you know, whatever the team needs, that's always been my motto, wherever I play. Um, you know, I've, I played for torts and I've moved up and down and played every position, but goalie, it felt like, um, but that's, you know, I like that. I like that challenge. So that to me is, is what I hope to bring is wherever, you know, coach needs me or uh, the team needs me that I'm going to provide that. And, and, uh, you know, I feel confident in that, but also I'm not going to go in there thinking I got to be this or that. I'm just going to go in there and do what I do. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, it clicks with the team, which I think it will, cause it's already a great team over there. And they, you know, they seem like unbelievable guys, especially the ones I know. And, um, I'm really looking forward to being a part of that locker room. Hey, Nick, you know, you talked about how, you know, your dad had the, the trademark jump when he scored goals uh, for the Maple Leafs and, and the other teams he played for. And you did that on your first goal. Your brother did that on his first NHL goal. Uh, but you said you draw the line at, at bringing back the, the, uh, the, the trademark salad bowl helmet that your dad made famous. Uh, <laughs> did, did, you, did you ever wear that old Northland bucket? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've put it on a few times. And I've got to admit, it is the most comfortable helmet I've ever worn. 
uh, but it is the most hit, the most hideous helmet I've ever seen. <laughs> so I don't know how my dad pulled it off. No wonder he had to fight so much. I think in his career. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. We still use it to strain the pasta. I was saying in, in the sink at the house. So um, that's great. It's uh, it's definitely uh, it's up in his, his office. I think uh, the last I saw it. And uh, it's so cool how many people since you know being traded have have resonated with that you know they're like oh we need you to bring back the helmet and i just laugh at how that's still you know one of the things they remember my dad by and um you know it's it's definitely his trademark so that's why that's him you know we we, we were cheering him on and and doing the jump and all that and his kids but that was his thing and uh, i think he's really proud that we we obviously paid respect to him in our first goals and uh, but I don't, I don't know about the helmet. I don't think I can bring that back. No, I don't blame you for that. Although it's got character, <laughs> man. I'll say that. Like, that, Felina, that is your dad's bucket. Like, no one else can wear it. No yeah. one else can rock it. He owns it. And he's he's left his mark on the game. There's something to say about that. Yeah, it's pretty funny. I know yeah, Stan Makita, I think, was the other guy that wore it. And uh, I still hear my dad's name more than him, which is impressive for how Absolutely. good Stan Makita was. So, Absolutely. pretty funny. Uh, with Nick Foligno, uh, you've obviously, like you mentioned, you've made your mark on, on the National Hockey League. You've played 950 games, so you're creeping up on that 1,000-game mark, and that's what Milan Lucic did last night, and Lucic got into a tilt, and it was a pretty good one with Sabarin. Could you see what, – what do you – I know we're putting the car way before the horse, but if you were to hit 1,000, <laughs> would you feel like I got to fight, I got to score, I have to do something tonight because I'm playing 1,000 oh, yeah. tonight? You got to do something, you know, it's a thousand game. You want to remember it. So, uh, obviously scoring would be the ideal one. Um, but, right. uh, yeah, I saw that for Lucic, which is impressive. You know, I think he was in my draft class. Um, so starting to see those guys hitting that number, um, you know, he just makes you realize how far you've come and, and it's an amazing honor. You know, I remember my dad doing it and just being so impressed with that and, and how big a deal it really is. And, to be close to it i mean it's obviously it'd be a great uh, you know thing to put in into my a feather in the cap so to speak and uh, but i haven't thought about it too much i got you know some time before then and i said i'd like to have about a thousand playoff games that would be a, a way better testament but uh but it'll be pretty pretty special and the need to see some guys like i said for my draft class start to hit that number and um you know it's, it's been uh, it's been an amazing ride what did you make of the, the Flames went, the entire team went without helmets uh, in the warm-up, I assume, in a, in a tribute to Lucic for his 1,000th game. Where, where do you stand on that one? Are you a helmet-off guy? I, I was until I started losing all my hair. And then, uh, so I'm glad I, I got it in, out of my system when I was young. Now I shaved my head since, so I could probably bring it back and wouldn't look too silly. Um, but uh, I would love, yeah, we had a team rule in, in Columbus. You couldn't wear a helmet, and all the guys thought it was because I made the rule secretly uh, so I wouldn't have to show my head. But, <laughs> but yeah, it would be, uh, it'd be nice to, to go no helmet again. I'll see how I feel. Uh, if, that, if that's an opportunity in Toronto, I don't know what the rule is, but I might, I might throw it out there one time. Yeah, well, there's a lot of grizzled vets, like you mentioned, on this team. I mean, you, you started your career. Jason Spezza was on that Ottawa team your first few years there, and Spez is still in town, and then you would think, you know, Spez will be 38 this year, that he would be the grizzled vet of grizzled vets, but he's basically a child compared to Thornton. I mean, Jumbo's still kicking around his beard, and I got to believe Jumbo can basically do whatever he wants. I can't picture Sheldon Keefe telling him, you have to wear a helmet in, in warm-up. Like, what, what do you think that experience would be like, getting in the room and seeing guys like Thornton and Spezza and the guys that are older than you still kicking around and playing prominent roles here? I said I told that to Spez already. I'm just so excited not to be the oldest guy on the team anymore. I'm just <laughs> right. a young kid. That's probably why I feel so rejuvenated. Yeah. Uh, you know, with just those guys around. And but I, I'm really excited to. You know, it's been a while since I've honestly played with uh, an older player. To be honest, you know, it's kind of really? crazy to say, but we've had such a young team in Columbus. Um, you know, Brandon Dubinsky was the last guy that, and he was just a year older than me. So. Um, you know, I think it's just, it's, I'm excited about, you know, it's, it's always the learning part of it, right? For me. And I think that's when you, when you feel like you stop learning, I think that's when you got to get out of the game. That's probably why you see Joe and, and the way he is, he just looks like he's having a blast out there, you know, and he's probably having so much fun learning from Marner and Matthews and Nylander and Tavares. And, you know, he just looks like a guy that soaks it all in. So that's what I look forward to doing when the learning from him, learning from Jason again, um, being around those guys and, how are they able to stay in the game? I'm going to learn that because, I mean, I don't want to end anytime soon. So what is it that they're doing? You know, so it's, it's exciting for me uh, just to have those guys in the room and learn off them. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that. 
with uh, hey, Nick. Uh, sorry, Nick sorry. Hey, sorry. Let me just stop in here because I want to ask you about you know learning experiences based on what you've been saying here. And and you played a playoff game. You played multiple playoff series in Toronto last summer without fans, and that's going to be the case again this year. The fans are are not on the verge of stepping back into the building. It doesn't appear as if it's going to happen anytime soon. So how can you learn from that experience? And what did you learn from that experience? And I'm sure the rest of the team, the Leafs anyway, uh, can learn from that experience that you can apply this year because it's going to be essentially a carbon copy. You're going to be playing in an empty building for at least the first two rounds. Yeah. Well, I think I learned that you have to create your own energy. You know, how you play the game a lot of times, you know, catapults you into this, into the, into the game and, and what you, you know, what you provide and, you know, I can be one of those guys. I learned how important that was during the bubble. Uh, even early on this year, we had such a young team that didn't quite understand that in Columbus. And when we had no fans, it, it really affected us. And, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing the teams that can figure out how to play the right way and give yourself energy and, and, and allow you to, your game to get going. Uh, a lot of times you're the one that has success because of just, you know, your bench comes to life. And your bench is so important for everyone to feel like they're part of the game and, you know, the energy that you get off of that. So that's something that I noticed and I'll make sure, you know, I'm kind of going backwards in a, in a weird way. We've had fans in the States uh, for a little while now. So it'll right. be weird for me to kind of get back into that environment. But, you know, I just have, thank, thank God I have that bubble experience. And even earlier on that I can remind myself of how important that energy is, the positive talk, the, the things you're doing on the ice to, to give yourselves a chance to, to really come together as a group and, um, you know, I think that's obviously, you know, a testament to the Toronto team already. I mean, look what they've been able to accomplish this year. They seem like such a close-knit group and, and play with a ton of energy and excitement. So I'm just looking forward to adding to that and, and making sure that that's something I focus on when I get back. Hey, Nick, I know you, you, you talked about how, you know, it meant so much for you to, to watch your dad play uh, in the NHL in Toronto. You, you tweeted out as you were leaving Columbus, you know, a nice picture of uh, your three kids. You called them your, your greatest cheerleaders. I mean, what, what's that like to leave them behind? And I was just curious about, like, is, is, is this a COVID-related decision or is it a school-related decision? Or why did you guys kind of come to the family staying in Columbus instead of Toronto? Yeah, I think a little bit of both, unfortunately. I mean, this is the reality of the situation right now in Ontario where everything's locked down, and I, I didn't want to put my family in an experience when they really are able to kind of go about their own life right now with school and activities that are kind of open up in Columbus and um, and also some familiarity for my kids. You know, as hard as it is, I think they realize they're old enough to know, you know, why I'm leaving, uh, what I'm going to try to do, and I think, you know, having that conversation with them, it just – it felt right to go and focus on this and have them continue on and, you know, not have them feel like they're burdened or, or not able to do the things. Cause I mean, three kids and, and, you know, my wife, I think I, I, I was saying to her, I'm, I'm sure she's going to be losing it on me at some point. here. <laughs> Once I'm gone, but, um, but I think just the, the understanding of how strong she is for me and, uh, and knowing uh, the kind of woman she is that she can hold down the fort. And, and I think it's given me the strength to decide that this is probably the best bet. You know, it's all, I'm going in here to do a job, and I think they respect that and know how, how special this opportunity is for me. Um, so as much as it's probably going to hurt me more because, you know, I'm, I, my family is a lot of the reason why I play the game. Uh, you know, outside of hockey, that's all I think about. So um, that'll be probably the hardest thing on me, but I know they'll be busy and, and uh, probably won't even think about me too much. <laughs> but uh, I know they're excited for me, and that's, that's all that matters. And um, yeah, like I said, going back to it, just it, it, this is this is an opportunity for me to go and realize my dream of, of trying to win a Stanley Cup, and we just felt like it was the right move. And and, and I was saying before, you know, this, this talk about sacrifice you have to make, and as hard as it is to leave your family, I think putting into perspective what's really going on in the world and all the sacrifices that people are making that are really making a difference in the world. You know, our doctors, our frontline workers. This isn't sacrifice. This is you know, I'm going to play a game. I'm going to, you know, realize my dream, and these people are fighting life or death every day. So uh, when you put that into perspective, I think it makes an easier decision, and uh, I'll have my kids cheering me on from afar. Yeah, that's a great point. Well put with Nick Felino. We'll get you out of here on uh, one more question about your kids because you got three of them. You play in the NHL. Your brother plays in the NHL. Your dad played in the NHL. So how does the fandom work out with the kids? Because I got to think you're pushing for one team. Your dad's probably been pushing for a team, if not multiple teams. Marcus, the same thing. Is everyone just follow you in the house? Are they a fan of their uncle, their grandpa's teams? How does that work out? 
My uncle, um, uncle, we call him Uncle Moose. Marcus is Moose. He's got a nickname. We, I named him that because when he was a kid, he, he was very uncoordinated. He looked like a baby moose. So um, <laughs> it's stuck with him ever since. Uh, um, so the kids call him Uncle Moose, and he pulled a fast one on us this year, and he actually sent my kids a bunch of Minnesota Wild hockey gear. My son was playing hockey for the first time this year. He's five years old. And so he got his name on his gloves with the Minnesota Wild colors and so he won up me pretty good, and uh, I'm, I'm probably I'd say they're probably on more Uncle Moose fans than Dad fans Uh-oh. just because he got him some awesome gear. So I'll, I'll have to get him back one day on that. But uh, I think they're just I think they they just love the fact that um, you know their uncle and dad play in the league. Their their Nono is his name. Grandpa is Nono in Italian, and um, and he he played. And um, I, I love that we just get to teach the kids the passion of the game. And I think that's been so fun. It was caught by, by my dad to Marcus and I, and to be able to pass it on to our kids now uh, is just so neat. So I think they're just hockey fans in general. And now I'm trying to teach them about Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. And uh, so they're they're getting a pretty good uh, schooling right now in the hockey world. And I think they're loving every minute.